Okay, so now we are recording for the uh, March 2022 Loop Back Monthly Maintainers Call. Uh, welcome everyone to today's monthly call. And uh, yeah, so uh, maybe we can just start off um, as this tradition uh, with you, Diana, from your end. Uh, any updates on the OpenJS Foundation? Yeah, um, I think um, you, you got the email to uh, refer. So we finally, I think, uh, sort of have the, the have it ready um, in terms of once we give them the the email address that we want the the email the email alias to send to, then uh, we should be able to get it set up. Uh, I got the confirmation from you, refer um, Raymond and Mario. Uh, I sent a email to Francisco because I think he doesn't check uh, Slack uh, very often. Um, so I'm going to see if we can um, either if I don't hear from him today and maybe I will just um, send the email reply back to Brian um, saying that he had the list and then um, if we uh, if uh, Francisco wants to have be included and then we can always add him to uh, ask him to um, include him later on. Uh, I think that I think that that would be once we get that. I think we can start updating uh, our readme's and all that. And so I think that would be a very good um, thing that we will be able to start hopefully yeah. very soon. I think. Um, yeah, I, I think it's great. Uh, we finally got the domain transfer settled, and I think uh, as uh, Brian has mentioned uh, this. Everything else from here should be rather quick for them uh, from from their end. Um, for the on the topic of the domain, uh, I've managed to successfully verify the uh, GitHub uh, with with GitHub that we own the domain. So now it should be slightly more protected from uh, domain hijacking uh, in GitHub pages, which is uh, which which is great. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that's. Generally, all for the OpenJS update, right? That's just the email. Mm -hmm. and hopefully yeah. So one one question, uh, one question for the blog one, like the blog dot io. Yeah. Would do we need to have it verified, or because it's a subdomain, is already verified? Uh oh. So for for that, I I believe uh, as long as you have the higher level domain already verified, everything from down there is considered verified. Uh, so in the sense that you would know that it's not verified because you wouldn't be able to use GitHub pages on that subdomain. Uh, that that's the idea uh, behind the verified domains. So that um, in case we misconfigure something, we leave out a domain, uh, and then if the right combination of wrong things happen, uh, it could re lead to a domain hijacking. Uh, but uh, with verified domains, this should mitigate it uh, outright. So it should not happen. Uh, but I think for the loopback blog, um, I'm hoping to be able to like put it under the sub pass instead of, instead of the subdomain. I know currently it's under subdomain because it's, it's easier because you just have to enable the GitHub pages environment. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm still working on the shell script to um, uh, copy over the Git um, repo over into the loopback IR repo. So hopefully you can push that up soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, uh, maybe I can go on to my my agenda. Uh, I think I've, pre I've I've prepared a bit of a slide deck here, but it's a rather short one, quickly done, so it can help. So just just to help uh, go through the list. So, uh, let me just quickly share. So hopefully this goes into the recording as well. Uh, okay. So I'm just gonna quickly start my session. So, just to give some updates for this month, uh, from my end, because uh, a lot of things have happened in re regard to the security area. Uh, so generally, just want to talk about the security program. I think we roughly just touched on it just now. It's around the email. Then we're talking about the security advisory, so the security repository, and uh, perhaps maybe a dedicated security subdomain in the sense of what. Uh, what's the current status of it? What do we want to target, and how we are progressing towards reaching that target? 
And then uh, finally, we'll uh, talk a bit about S bonds because uh, it's been getting quite a bit of chatter since last year, uh, especially since the I think the directive under the U.S. government. Uh, so uh, it is is something that uh, it's worth looking into. So uh, about the security program, I think uh, we all know what's the current status. Uh, it's under an IBM hosted email under reachsl at us .com. Now there are certain intrinsic problems with it, not necessarily problematic, but uh, it is just intrinsically um, why we want to shift over to a Lubeck IO um, that is outside of uh, IBM's own security uh, program. Because right now Lubeck is under the OpenJS Foundation, and notably because uh, it's technically under still under IBM, so the rest of the technical steering committee don't actually know what is the process uh, for uh, for the security program. So right now it just goes into IBM and then there's a bit of fingers crossed that uh, uh, that there is a process in place. Uh, I... Yeah, I, I think so far we've been going through like a sort of an open source route. Um, it, it's just that we're using an IBM hosted email, which now only we have access, which is a problem. Um, so I think, yeah, so I think it would be good to like um, have the email change so that all of the TSC member can can access it and um, have any clearer process uh, if if it is um, like to clarify if there's any need for that. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be. I think I think that's the great thing. Yeah, and I think you just basically mentioned the points that there's no clear email manager. So who's managing the email? I I am I'm, I'm assuming it's you, Diana. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yes. But of course, I think the better outcome is that we have multiple people looking at it, multiple people informed about it instead of just one person so that uh, uh, everyone's in the loop and uh, it doesn't accidentally slip through, right? So uh, that's what we want to get out of it. And the other problem is that currently there's no PGP encryption key. So uh, any security reporters, they cannot encrypt their email uh, when they send it to us. Uh, so it is something we want to add as well, which is a PGP key that they can use to encrypt their emails and privately send us their POCs or their reports. So what do we want to target from this? Uh, the, can you see the slide? Just making sure. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just making sure WebEx isn't causing any issues. So uh, the target is to, uh, like, like I mentioned before, OpenGS Foundation email setup. Uh, we are currently working on it. Uh, so the TSC email is first, and then afterwards, once we are comfortable with the TSC email, we know how it works, then we'll move on to uh, the security email as well. So after we've gotten the security email, there are certain things we need to do. Um, as mentioned before, we need to create the standardized security MD in all of our Git repos, and we also need to create a PGP encryption key that uh, we will store in the security Git repository. And the current status, Oh, uh, and I think that's about it for the security program. Uh, I thought I had another slide there. So now we just move on to the security advisories. Uh, currently, it's stored under this URL. I, I think it's this URL under doc Ian sec. Uh, so currently, it's meant for manual human consumption. So you have to read it manually because it's a HTML page. And because of this, it cannot be automatically ingested by security tools like Qradar or your SAW tools like uh, Swimlane and whatnot. And because it's also in a, a HTML format, in a freeform format, we have no way to sync it with other vulnerability databases like the GitHub Security Advisory Database and the GitLab uh, Advisory Database, which both have been open source, I think, very recently in the past two weeks. So it's something that we want to be able to keep in sync so that it has consistent information um, between our advisories and their advisories. And also, there's another problem is that because it's a freeform format, there is some inconsistent or potentially missing details in our actual security advisory. So, uh, one case is that um, you can, if you look at the uh, advisories in like the GitHub and uh, SNCC, uh, what we see is that uh, there's some additional information in there that our advisories do not have. So, for example, uh, although we do have the CVSS scores, so and then so we have the base severity and the uh, base score. Um, what is missing is actually the uh, vector string. So we don't know what actually resulted in that uh, score and that severity uh, rating. Uh, so for, uh, for someone who's trying to understand the extent of the impact of the vulnerability, uh, 
it, it actually requires multiple um, go, going across multiple external databases to find out and build out this full picture, which uh, isn't a great experience. And because of this, there isn't a true source of truth because the source of truth, which is our website, doesn't contain all of the information. So they still have to go to other places to create that full horizon, that full picture. And what we want to do is mitigate uh, these problems. So the way we do that is, first of all, we want to produce uh, machine readable advisories. So, uh, so that includes formats like CSAF, CVRF, OSV, and the new GitLab uh, format. So you might be asking, why do we want to support multiple formats? Why not just stick to one like CSAF? Uh, first of all, is that by publishing, by producing multiple formats, we can ensure wider tool compatibility because uh, across these tools, there isn't a single format that is um, guaranteed to work, right? There isn't a single format that every tool supports. And the other thing about uh, producing multiple formats in the security repositories that we can enforce mapping between formats. So uh, if we publish the CSAF and OSV formats together, we can actually write some uh, some Node.js scripts to actually ensure that the mapping between CSAF and OSV is consistent across all of our advisories. And that's what we're currently doing. And also finally, because we have this mapping and validation going on, uh, all of these formats can act as the source of truth. So regardless which format you pick, uh, you can uh, use either one of them and you can be confident that it's as accurate as it can be. And uh, because uh, uh, because of this uh, mapping between formats and validation, uh, we are also able to ensure that we don't have to like manually um, like translate between formats every time we want to update another database. Uh, so uh, that way, uh, we can keep consistency every time we want to publish to GitLab or GitHub or some other database. Uh, so the anchor format will be CSAF. Uh, that is to say, this is the format where we write most of the um, most of the data into uh, CSAF specifically because it's the latest standard. It's the successor to CVRF. And it is the most uh, comprehensive and the most flexible format out of all of the ones mentioned on top. Uh, so that is to say that OSV and CVRF and the GitLab format will be validated against the CSAF format. Um, but of course, I think the other formats also have certain things that CSAF doesn't have. So by so so in the same way, we will also. Um, manually enter those things into the other formats as well for what CSAF cannot handle. Uh, the other things that we want to target is to also support VEX or the Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange format. Uh, so this isn't really a format, but more of a con uh, more abstract concept. So the idea is that um, it's, a, it's for writing about the impact of a vulnerability in a dependency. So it's not necessarily a vulnerability in loopback itself, but rather a vulnerability in a dependency of loopback. And we want to know what's the true impact of it on the loopback framework. So uh, VEX essentially allows us to do that uh, because um, because uh, I think we've all seen npm audit, right? Every time we install a new a new package, we see like several high level uh, vulnerabilities, medium level severity vulnerabilities, but we don't actually understand what the actual impact of it is on the package that we that we are using uh, because it's very subjective, right? So for example, a a vulnerability in one of the CLI uh, dependencies may not be as severe as a vulnerability in the server uh, in, a, in the server dependencies because the servers will be exposed publicly compared to CLI where the data is usually vetted by the de by the developers. So uh, the VEX allows us to achieve that uh, break between uh, the dependency vulnerability and then the true impact in loop back. Uh, so that's something we want to explore. And the other things that we want to look into maintaining a CPE extended dictionary. So CPE is the common platform enumeration. Uh, you can think of it as a way to represent the, um, the, the software that we are, that, that someone may install. So for loop back, uh, I believe there are some CPEs for loop back already uh, that's currently under IBM. Uh, so we do want to uh, ideally migrate them to a consistent loopback CPE. 
And the great thing about CPEs is that it allows us to tell uh, audit tools um, what versions of loopback are vulnerable in a syntax and format that is uh, consistent and familiar for them. So uh, CPEs, the idea is that we want to generate it programmatically. So we, the idea is that we would retrieve all the versions of all the packages we maintain from NPM, and then we would just generate the CPEs uh, using a Node.js script. And then also we want to uh, periodically email NIST to update their root dictionary. Uh, so the idea is that we maintain our own list as the source of truth, but then we publish it to NIST uh, so that um, it can uh, keep in sync with the rest of the broader community. So uh, let's move on to the what is the current status? How much have we progressed to that target? Uh, so I have already written the last three security advisories. I've not pushed these changes yet, but it's been written. Uh, so what's left is to re is to write the rest of the other security advisories in the CSAF and OS format. And the mapping validation is about 90% done. Uh, there's just some, some remaining small parts I want to uh, map as well between these two formats. And uh, what and uh, there's some additional stuff we need to do as well. So for the OSV format, uh, we do need to register the LBSEC prefix under the Open SSF uh, OSV schema git repo, uh, so that um, because this is actually part of the OSV specification, uh, where we can reserve the prefix so that we can link across multiple OSV databases. Uh, so in in this in this sense, uh, by registering this prefix, we can link between the GitHub and GitLab advisory database and with our own advisory database. So we can have multiple instances of the same vulnerability reported across the databases, but then uh, we can sync them up so that the tools can generate a single report from it. Uh, for the GitLab format, uh, we're currently uh, waiting for clarification on the license for the JSON schema uh, for, for, for validation, uh, because currently it's actually under a proprietary license. Uh, we've I've already opened an issue with them to uh, hopefully uh, open it into a standardized FOSS license like MIT. Uh, currently, they say they are looking into it and they'll get back to me on that soon. Uh, for CVRF, it's on the to-do list uh, because it's the predecessor to CSAF. Uh, it's not the main focus at the moment, but because CVRF and CSAF are very different in their syntax, one is XML, the other one is JSON, uh, we do want to eventually support CVRF so as to be able to support as many tools as possible. But generally, the mapping should be relatively easy because the the um, abstract tree of it is uh, very similar. So what about uh, the website, right? Uh, as mentioned before in the agenda, that I do see that we should should eventually at some point create a dedicated uh, security subdomain, perhaps security.loopback.io. And the rationale for this is to make it easy to, to discover, because uh, currently the security advisories is a bit hard to find. Uh, essentially, you have to click on the Loopback IO website, you have to click documentation, but then you have to also go to the root of the documentation page, uh, which is um, another click, and it's not as obvious. Uh, because the sidebar actually changes, right? So, uh, so, so it's not as easy to discover it right now. So, if we create a dedicated subdomain, um, we can reduce the amount of clutter. Uh, and the other thing is that this, by creating a separate subdomain, we can also reduce the impact of changes to the main website. So, if we say like migrate from Jekyll to another, uh, another web page builder, um, that would not affect this 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 uh, separate microsite and this will also reduce the likelihood of us moving files around so we can standardize and we have more freedom uh, on standardizing a um, specific file hierarchy for the security subdomain. Uh, the other part is that we also want to complete uh, the whole automation process. So previously, uh, as I mentioned in the security advisories for the Git repository, uh, that part only covers um, ingestion, right? So it only covers generating of the um, the uh, security advisories in a machine readable format, but it doesn't actually aid in automatic discovery of those files. Those things would still need to be downloaded manually. So by uh, creating a separate security subdomain, we can now support uh, machine discoverability using uh, well-known 
um, well-known uh, API. So for OSV, they have the OSV1 API, so that's something we can expose. And the other one is for CSAF, uh, there is a set of um, specifications to allow discovery of CSAF uh, using Roly and uh, another subdomain called csaf.data.security.loompad.io. Uh, so in, in this way, uh, this will help promote us from just being a security advisory producer to becoming a security advisory publisher. So it, by being a publisher, we're able to allow tools to just uh, point to our website and then uh, discover all of these files without needing to manually download all of the advisories and then uh, uploading it to their internal systems. So uh, for any progress on that, uh, generally for the website, uh, it's being blocked by the security git repo that we're working on because we need to complete the security repository first before we can create the website itself. Uh, and we will revisit this once the Git repo is ready. So the Git repo will be ready once we've gotten all the security security advisories uh, up there. And then once we've gotten all the validation scripts uh, there, and once we are confident that, um, that uh, it will be stable. So the idea is that uh, once we've gotten it stable, uh, we can then create some CI scripts to automatically uh, push these changes to this uh, security subdomain. Uh, so now let's move on to SBOM. Uh, so the current status, or should I say, yes, this is more of a primer of SBOM. Um, so first of all, SBOM generally has two main purposes. First is license compliance. So get a list of all the licenses of the dependencies. And then the other one is also to get a bill of materials to see what dependencies are there. So the difference between license compliance and the dependency bill of materials is that one is for legal reasons. The other one is to see, to check if you're vulnerable to certain things. So if you think of NPM audit, that's more of the second one, which is to get a list of vulnerable dependencies. Now, currently there's two major formats. Uh, SPDX is for uh, license compliance. It's the oldest format that I'm aware of. It's by the Linux Foundation. Uh, so in that sense, there are a lot of tools out there for it, but a newer format that is under um, under OWASP is a Cyclone DX. Now Cyclone DX actually can do multiple things, not just uh, license compliance, but it can also do uh, bill of, uh, dependency bill of materials. It can also do VEX. It can uh, do a lot more things as well. So it's quite a flexible format. But more importantly, uh, with Cyclone DX, there's actually already tools, like first-class tools to convert it to SPDX. And there's also first-class tools to actually look inside the NPM dependency tree and actually extract the dependencies from there and generate the Cyclone DX files uh, from, from that. So Cyclone DX is actually has quite a bit of a healthy ecosystem, a healthy community, and it's, I think, uh, because of these reasons, it's something worth looking into, it should be the easiest one to adopt. Um, and if we um, if we adopt Cyclone DX, then we should be able to adopt SPDX quite easily by just using the conversion tool. Uh, another one that's actually coming up is very, very, rather new. I think it just came up the past month. Uh, it's called GitBomb. I, I believe this is under the Open SSF. I'm not too sure on that, uh, but it they do have a Slack channel under the Open SSF. And what's different with GitBomb compared to SPDX and Cyclone DX is that. Uh, GitBomb actually documents source code artifacts instead of the distributed artifacts. So when you think of SPDX and Cyclone DX, uh, what they actually track is actually the artifacts that actually get shipped as uh, as a dependency, right? So the disk directory and all that. Uh, but GitBomb actually goes to the original source code and actually um, documents uh, the, the original source code so that we can create the link between the distribution files and the original source code. Uh, currently, it's very new, so there isn't a, a mature set of tools yet, but it's something that uh, I'm currently uh, keeping an eye on. Um, so the current position. Uh, currently, we do not have license compliance or dependency s bombs, uh, And with uh, license s bombs, uh, we've looked at certain tools, so FOSA, was one of it because it was a SaaS offering, so it seemed quite uh, appealing because we didn't need to set up any infrastructure and they have a free tier as well. 
But one of the problems is that, is that we cannot export this to SPDX or Cyclone DX. So uh, for, for FOSSA, it's really only useful for compliance within the loopback project itself, but we cannot share this information uh, with users of loopback uh, as a result of this limitation. The other one is Fossology. I think I mentioned this in the Slack channel. Uh, one of the differences with Fossology is that uh, one of the main things about Fossology is that it does file level analysis. So uh, I, I believe Fossa also does this, but uh, what file level analysis means is that it actually reads the contents of all the dependencies files and then looks for certain keywords and does certain heuristics to find the copyright, uh, notice the, the licenses that are inside as well. And the great thing about this is that it's also under the Linux Foundation. It is the most comprehensive solution. Uh, but one of the problems is that it requires a web server. And, um, and more importantly, we have the question on whether or not we want to actually maintain um, and, actually, and actually review every single file of all of the dependencies of loopback. All right. So uh, we, we could choose to not include dependencies for now. So we could just start off at, as, as um, like, monitoring the contents of our own files first so that we don't inadvertently add uh, other copyrighted stuff that is that is incompatible into loopback itself and and then perhaps we could use something like cyclone dx as mentioned before to actually use the dependency c3 to retrieve the uh, to retrieve the copyright um the, the license information from package JSONs. so uh, as i just mentioned cyclone dx tool does a dependency tree level analysis. So uh, so why wouldn't you want to do this? One of the problems is that um, you kind of have to trust that the package JSON, the license um, keyword inside the package JSON is actually correct. So you have to trust that the dependency authors actually did their due diligence when uh, putting their licenses inside. And we have, we have noticed before that certain uh, authors do not follow this directly. Uh, so sometimes you see the license is MIT on the package JSON, but then you look inside, oh, there's actually a GPL license code inside. So, um, so it's not uh, as comprehensive, but it is much easier to use. And I think it's a great stepping stone uh, for uh, getting license compliance. Uh, now I'm aware that OpenGSF is currently looking into a Linux Foundation in-house solution, uh, but they as far as I know, they have not said there's any publicly available progress on it. Uh, it's quite in the early stages. Uh, but it's also something we, uh, we should be monitoring as well uh, to see um, if this is something uh, they want to have look back to use as well. Uh, so I understand that OpenGSF wants the uh, projects to use some kind of tool to at least do license compliance. So. Um, this is something we want to be able to align with when they come, uh, when, when they're able to come to a fruition on which solution they want to go with. Uh, so for dependency S bombs, there is a unique problem with loopback. Uh, well, not too unique, but uh, it is just inherently a, a problem with loopback because loopback is a library. So people don't really use loopback as is. They actually build other software with loopback. And because of NPM version ranges, it's very difficult to get an idea of what dependencies uh, a loopback user will be using, right? Because the versions change with, with every passing second. Uh, so the tree can be quite different from one installation to the other, even if they're using the same release cycle of loopback. Uh, so this is something we could explore, but it's pretty far down in the backlog because um, actually generating a comprehensive list of every possible package and their versions that loopback would use in one way or another. It's um, something that, that I think isn't, had, isn't really a solved problem at the moment, but it's something that we want to take note of. So that's, uh, that's about it for, this, for, for my end. So I know that was a lot of information, but I just wanted to get it out there because uh, there's a lot of uh, new and exciting things happening in, in the space. And hopefully uh, loopback can adopt um, these things so that uh, it can position itself uniquely as being one of the few taking uh, security very seriously um, and being able to cover the whole security life cycle, uh, whether it's S-bombs or security advisories. And 
And with all the targets that we have, uh, we hope to be able to implement them within the next year or so. Uh, as for the, the security repository, I do hope to be able to wrap it up by the in, in about two weeks' time. Um, so if everything goes well, then the security repositories uh, should be done in two weeks' time. And then from there, we can update the Lubeck IO website to automatically generate the HTML pages uh, from the security uh, repository. And uh, yeah, that kind of comes to the end of my uh, slide deck. Any questions? <laughs> uh, not really. I think this is good, very good information. Um, thank you for looking into that. Uh, I probably need some time to digest it all. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm thinking that like, um, I guess there, there are quite a lot of different areas, right? And so I'm thinking whether we want to like, we certainly would need to start somewhere and then start small and then so that like okay we say um i can run one one of the things like there are multiple format that we can support um so maybe we like there's some kind of um uh not really a roadmap because like i know yes but then like sort of like a, a progression and okay this is the things that we want to do in the near term and then like and then like after that then the next phase what will be what we will we want to 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 tackle yeah uh so that doesn't uh, make sense yeah that that makes sense because uh i think because of the model of how loopback works in terms of the con the maintenance model uh effectively on this area i'm i am working on this as a one-man person uh but that kind of applies in general to any part of loopback right because everyone focuses on the part that they want to work on. Uh, so in terms of like short term, medium term, long term goals, uh, I think the short term is to get the security advisable, the, the, the security advisory formats uh, up. Uh, so because that will be like the main crux of, of, of like where all the data comes from. And once we're able to do that, um, then we can move on to link things like the CPEs and, and whatnot uh, so that we can start um, slowly building up this um, this this complete solution, right? Um, as for the sub the security subdomain, it is probably for like medium term, so maybe several months down the line, because uh, mainly it will be another web server that we will need to maintain because uh, uh, of the APIs that we need to uh, expose. Uh, uh, but I think. In, in general, the, the focus right now is uh, to get the security advisories out and then um, continue to explore for the SBOM side uh, because I think that's a, a, it's moving quite fast. So there's a lot of uh, new tools, new uh, features that's coming out. So it's, um, it, it's something we want to monitor and then we want to carefully decide, okay, we want to use, we want to adopt this part of SBOM, we want to give this to our users. Uh, but at, I think at this moment, we have not really decided uh, what's the best way forward for the SBOM at this moment. Because uh, uh, I think, I've, as I mentioned before, like for Sology and all, uh, they are great tools, but one of the limitations is that we need a web server for, 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 for Sology. And also because I think the OpenJS Foundation is also looking into this as well. So I'm not sure if that's going to cause um, duplicate effort on that front. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I think I probably should put this, whatever materials into the governance as well. It's like meeting resources. Uh, Okay, so that would be for. Uh, okay, so that would be for that. Um, just to check if there's anything else on the agenda. Uh, oh yeah, and okay, so and then I think this is the final thing from my end. Uh, GitHub organization MFA enforcement. Uh, so just as part of just checking the security posture of the GitHub organization, 
uh, I noticed that we are not enforcing multi-factor authentication. And I believe there's still some uh, of our uh, members that are not using MFA. So uh, I will be turning it on in the next 24 hours or so, but I will uh, take note of who has not turned it on because uh, once we turn it on, then uh, those that don't have MFA will no longer be able to access the organization. Uh, but of course, um, I think generally it should be, um, it, it's generally acceptable to, to enforce MFA at, at this time, right? Um, it should be a general baseline. Uh, so yeah, uh, for, for those walking the oh, sorry, yes. Oh yeah. So, so, um, I forgot, um, so would we be able to send a message in the Slack channel, like in the general channel, um, saying that we will be enabled it by what date. And so if you haven't, and we have, don't, don't have the, um, the MFA, then you here's the link to how to do it. Um, and so that. Yeah, I I think because uh, this will only affect maintainers, uh, uh, it will only affect like members of the organization. So there'll be maintainers. I've already posted it in the maintainers chat. Uh, so I think about two weeks ago. So I give about two weeks grace period for everyone to turn on MFA. Um, if by this point they have not turned it on, then um, well, at some point we we will have to turn on the switch, right? So. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess I will, I will send one more um, info that, hey, FYI, we're going to be turning it on in the next 24 hours. If you did not turn on MFA, you'll be kicked out of the organization. Please reach out to so that we can re-add you once you've turned on MFA or, or something mm -hmm. like that. So uh, that yeah. would be what I would do, yeah. Okay, sounds good. All right. So um, from my side, some update for the blog post. I think I did it for the blog post for till back to 2019, I think. Um, I, I guess I, I think we only need to move, uh, copy over the look back for related blog posts. So we don't need to go all the way back. Um, so I will take a look to see if there's anything that is before 2019 that was still need to wants to copy over then after that i think we should be done in terms of um copying the content um one thing that i would hope to get to is to add the search feature because docosaurus has the search feature um i still need to look up how to do it um so but then other, other than that i think it's pretty much done Right. So I, yeah, I think I, yeah, one, one of the, speaking of the blog post, I, I noticed I, I'm not able to actually run the Docsaurus build. Uh, so, so that's the general oh. resources instead of the live server. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about your end, if it's, if it's able to work. Yeah, I was able to, you mean the, the local version, right? Uh, the build. So just build the artifacts as, as static artifacts instead of the live server. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. I was able to to build it and then deploy it to the 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 GH pages um, uh -huh. uh, branch. Okay, interesting. Think... Uh, that there might be some changes I didn't push. Um, like there, there's some like, uncommitted changes. Maybe I can I can double check as well. Actually, yeah. Maybe it's just my end. <laughs> Need to maybe reclone the repository. Uh -huh. So we'll, we'll see. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. The, the, the other thing I also need to work on is the GitHub action. That's like when, when we merge a PR, then it should rebuild the site. Um, there's something I need to, to take a look at as well. Right, that'd be great. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, so for the Loopback website, I think uh, in general, um, at least for my end, right? I'm not actually able to uh, run the loopback website because of how my system is set up. Because it, I think it uses Ruby three, but then uh, because of the requirements of GitHub, the, the GitHub pages gem, it can only use Ruby two, which uh, I don't have. Uh, so yeah, it, maybe we stick with GitHub pages. Maybe uh, we need to post it somewhere else eventually at some point. Otherwise, we're gonna just um, stale. 
going to be uh, be left behind in the world of Jekyll. Uh, but of course, I think generally updating the whole website, moving into another platform is going to be quite difficult. So maybe we can come up with something where uh, we can uh, leverage the new uh, Ruby tree, keep Jekyll, and then uh, if that's possible, then uh, that'd be great. Uh, uh, and, and, oh, and one more thing, uh, so with regards to the copyright, I think we've had quite a bit of discussion back and forth on that because there's quite a bit of uncertainty on it. Uh, so any updates on that? Uh, no, sorry about that. I haven't checked whether we can remove the, the year. I think that the only thing in question is whether we can remove the year completely, right? Because otherwise, we need to keep updating it with the mix um, copyright header, then it's going to be difficult. We, we won't be able to do it um, in the through the tools. Um, so I think yeah, I will I will follow up. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, I, I've done a bit of research on this, and from my understanding, is that the year actually uh, the, the way that the copyright works is that it's supposed to apply on each file individually. Uh, and the other things that the year it's supposed to only be updated when we update the file with any substantial changes. So technically, if we apply that principle, then the copyright copyright header doesn't need to be updated programmatically ever. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I do hope we can remove the year so <laughs> at least keep it cleaner. Um, for, I for the I, I have uh, I, I believe. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, with the security repository, I have actually um, used uh, an SPDX uh, format. So this is one that Linux Foundation actually recommends. Uh, so if you want to see how it's being done for that repository, you can take a look at it um, and then mm -hmm. see if IBM is okay with it. Uh, because it's, I think it's a bit of a weird syntax, but it seems to be genuinely accepted uh, by the Linux Foundation. Um, and because it actually uses a machine readable syntax, so it'll be um, easier. The idea is that it's supposed to be easier to uh, read and pass the, the copyright notice. Ah, I see. Yeah, because we're using the um, uh, something called Strong Tools module. So what it does is it look at um, so it will look at the package JSON to look for the author or I can't remember, there's a copyright um, uh, property. And so, and in the past we have IBM, right? And then it will look through, go through all the all, all the files. If it gets, um, if it changed, it got changed, then it will update the second year. Cause usually it has like say 20, 2018 comma, like 20, I don't know, 2021 or something like that. And they will update the last year because the, the last year is the, the last updated um, time. Um, so the, the problem with if we have mixed, like, because I think the proposal was for any new, well, for any existing file that's, um, that are updated after we have transferred to OpenJS Foundation is we will have the IBM and loopback contributor as the, um, the header, right? And so, so we won't be able to use the tool to, um, well, I guess we can use the tool to change it so that everything will be IBM and loopback contributor. Then in that case, we don't need to care about like, um, whether it is, um, yeah, we can we can make that consistent. Yeah. I can double check with um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that would be it. Would be great if we can uh, confirm on that. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, I, th I think yeah, so you mentioned about the copyright uh, attribute in the package JSON. I believe that's the copyright dot owner. Uh, that is the full name. Uh, so I think. Mm -hmm. That that one's not recognized in, in in any way of npm, so I'm not too sure where that came from. Uh, I assume it's just used for the tool itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think generally it should be yeah. safe safe to remove because that's the, the the copyright notice is everywhere else in the project. Uh, 
yeah and for the author i think i, I believe uh because um the author is also going to be a bit messy because some, the, the package would have two authors right ibm and the you know, loopback contributors uh, so i did a bit of research on this so uh, apparently we can use the contributors uh, attribute instead uh, which would allow for multiple field multiple contributors instead of just a single author so uh, perhaps we can do a repo wide change on that so that the the, the package JSON uses contributors instead of author uh, so that we can support multi this multiple copyright owners thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also uh, the other thing is that uh, I think I've mentioned this a, f a while back uh, in, in, in a few months ago, uh, some of our uh, connector repositories are still using the artistic license uh, I think uh, for for those, I, I think because the connector repositories generally there hasn't it, it, it's much more stable. I think the ones that still have the artistic uh, license don't have any DCO sign offs, so that means everything is still under IBM in terms of ownership. So if if we if, if that's the case, then hope uh, I think what we should do is migrate those to the MIT license, so that we can stay consistent. Uh, well, I think moving to DCO um, is a separate discussion as moving, changing the license. I think right now we can, we can, we can change it to um, DCO right now. Um, so probably I, I missed that when I transfer the the repos um, uh, for that, the license. The, the reason why I mentioned the DCO is because I think the way you see it, CLAs and DCOs work is quite different in this area because with CLAs, most of the time, and I think for the strong loop one also, the CLA essentially hands over the rights to strong loop and IBM, right? The, so, so IBM and strong loop retain the copyright. So in that case, uh, we can still change the copyright to whatever we want because we retain ownership of the, the license. Uh, compared to DCO, if we want to change the license after someone has done a DCO sign off, we actually need to reach out to them to relicense. So uh, for those with uh -huh. artistic license, if we don't have any DCOs on it, or if it's just our own DCOs, uh, then we should be safe to change it to MIT. Um, and But if we uh, already have outside contributors, then it's going to be more difficult. Uh, I see. Is there a particular reason to change it to from artistic to um to MIT, I thought the artistic one is also pretty um, perm permissive. I think uh, I I don't remember which version of the license the artistic license. I think, but I, I believe they were using one of the more newer ones. Uh, uh, I think generally it's just mainly for consistency. Because uh, if you're using loopback, you wanna have a consistent license for, for most of the pro most of the things, and MIT is the most permissive one in this area. Uh, and I think the other thing is that if we are still using the version one dot of the artistic license, I think uh, which, which I don't think we are, but in case we are using that, uh, I, I believe it is a bit problematic because uh, the I, I think there have been write-ups by GNU uh, which says that the writing of the license is not um, it is a bit too vague but I believe they solved that in the newer versions of the artistic license mm -hmm. okay yeah well I mean if, if we can if we can change it I think that would be great right it's just to keep it consistent at, if, if, if nothing else mm -hmm. okay I can take the, I can take a look. Yeah, and I think just to give a quick update on the uh, status of the renovate and the CIs, uh, generally I think it has stalled on my end for for, for those things <laughs> because um, priority shifts around. Uh, and the, with with CIs uh, for the databases, um, that is a bit of a tedious task because requires me. 
requires learning how to operate those databases as well. Uh, so I have uh, stumbled on, um, on some of them, uh, such as DB2. I'm not too sure how to <laughs> how to use its, 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 its utilities. Uh, but um, once I once I'm able to wrap up with this the security part, then hopefully we can revisit the the, the CI for that. Uh, for the renovate bot, I am still like reviewing the, the documentation because um, if we were to create a organization wide renovate config, uh, we want to make sure it is as um, it is as as stable as possible, so that if we make a change, it doesn't suddenly cause a cascading problem across all of our repos, which would be quite difficult to resolve. Uh, but uh, for that one, uh, no. For for both of those, generally, there's no significant updates on that. But mm -hmm. just was to mention. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so I guess I don't have anything else on my side. The a number of things I need to follow up on. Okay, uh, that's, I guess uh, that I guess uh, that means we can uh, conclude this uh, monthly call. So. Okay. All right. So thank you so much, Diana, for coming on uh, to this call. Really appreciate uh, you coming in uh, every month. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, more more can come in uh, the next call because I think unfortunately a lot of people have a lot of last minute uh, collisions in their schedules. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think there's some other stuff we also need to catch up on, like the mailing list. Uh, I believe Raymond has uh, ownership over that, uh, but we haven't really made much progress on that. Uh, but I think th for those, we can continue on Slack. Um, and then, yep. uh, okay, yeah, yeah. All right. So I, I sure. just, uh, yeah. So I, I just published the um, the slide deck to the governance, uh, and with that, uh, thank you so much for coming to this call. Uh, this concludes the March 20, 2022 uh, maintainers call. So uh, hope to see everyone uh, next month on February uh, second week on Wednesday. Thanks. Thank you, Rifa. All right. See ya. Yeah, right. Bye. Bye.